Hi, this is Greg from Structure Toolkit, and in this video we're going to go through how to design a residential raft slab to AS2870 using the simplified method. Designing a raft slab can be done using the residential slab module, whereby using the simplified method from AS2870, you can determine suitable beam geometries and spacing for various construction types. With the right inputs, you can even match the deemed to comply raft slabs from AS2870 which we will go through at the end of the video. There are a few reasons why you might want to use this method, such as validating or modifying the deem to comply arrangement to suit a particularly unusual beam layout, or to vary the beam sizes for a particular engineering reason. Something to be aware of, however, is this method does come with a large list of application requirements as outlined in clause 4.5.1 of the standard. The residential slab module will warn you of many of these requirements, but it is important to be aware of these beforehand. So to design a residential raft slab, we'll first open up the module. At the top, we have our slab parameters, where we can specify the type of construction, concrete strength, and also the geometry of our slab. The construction type is a dropdown of all the standard types of construction. For our example, we'll keep it as articulated masonry veneer and use a typical concrete strength of 25 MPA. For our slab, we'll design a 25 by 20 meters slab. And so we'll put in 20 meters for the width and 25 meters for the length. Something to remember here is that we are currently only doing the design in one direction being the design for stiffness along the length. What you'll need to do is swap the length and width at the end to design the other direction. To remind yourself in the future, you can also look to the note to the right over here. For most of our footing system inputs, we'll be using values similar to that of the deem to comply raft slabs provided in AS2870. This will make it easier to compare at the end and also when trying to match the deem to comply slabs to our simplified design method. For our slab thickness, we'll keep it as 100 millimeters and also keep our beam depth and width as 400 and 300. In our number of beams input, we can currently see the input is set as find. What this means is that it is currently finding the optimal number of beams to satisfy the stiffness requirements of AS2870, which we will have a look at shortly. If we look at the top, we can see that the optimal number of beams with our current inputs is two internal and two external beams, being four in total. And so if we switch this input to four, we will get the same answer. We could alternatively use the find option on either the beam depth or width as well. And you can see now that this find has set our beam depth as 348. Do note that you can only set one of these options to find at a time. And for now, we'll leave our beam depth as 400 and set our number of beams to find. Next, we have our saw parameters, with the first input being the profile type, which specifies whether the saw has deep seated moisture changes with a design depth of suction change being HS of three meters or more. This option will affect the limits of the YS we can specify and also the stiffness requirements, which we will see later. For our characteristic surface movement, we'll say our geotechnical report has specified class H1 and not deep seated with a YS of 60 millimeters. So we'll put in here 60. If we wanted to, we could then put in the name of this report below. In our case, we'll call it SDK Geotechnical. Next is the reinforcement of our slab. Generally speaking, this module will automatically fill the reinforcement specified for the corresponding deem to comply design. However, you will need to remember to change the slab reinforcement if, say, the slab span is greater than 25 meters to match what is calculated to the right of the input. With our case, we have three L11 trench mesh on the bottom and one N12 bar at the top. And as we are not over a 25 meter length in either direction, SL82 mesh is suitable. We'll come back to our reinforcement later to optimize after we go through the design requirements. The first part of the design is the stiffness requirements from clause 4.5. We're using the specified YS and the maximum allowable deflection from table 4.1. The required stiffness is determined using figure 4.1. 
The geometry we have input is then used to calculate the actual stiffness, which is where the find option determines the optimal value of the corresponding input, being the number of beams in our case. The next design check is for ductility, where using AS3600, a design moment that is 20% greater than the cracking moment capacity needs to be satisfied. We can see these design moments calculated for all four cases of our slab, being external sagging and hogging moments, and then the same for our internal beams. Within this, the first check that is done is the minimum strength requirements, being the minimum reinforcement for both hogging and sagging moments for external and internal beams. This is taken from clause 8.1.6 of AS3600. The second check is then calculating the moment capacity of the beams against the four cases that are calculated above. In our case, we can see that our reinforcement and capacities are insufficient, so we'll likely need to increase our reinforcement. What we can do now is go back above to our reinforcement input. There are likely several arrangements of reinforcement that will work, but one option that will work in our case is two layers of 3L12 trench mesh bottom, or in other words, 6L12. And four N16 bars at the top. Which if you look at the top summary, we can see now satisfies our requirements. What we would want to do now is to design along the other direction of our slab. And so we would then switch the width and length. Something you may have noticed is that our reinforcement is nowhere near what the deemed to comply option would specify for this situation, with our current reinforcement being close to that of full masonry. The reason for this is because of how the cracking moment is calculated, and if we want to match the designs of the deemed to comply section, we will need to make a few changes. Firstly, we will need to set the concrete strength to 20 MPa, which is stated in clause 4.4i. If we use a higher concrete strength, the cracking moment will increase, thus requiring more reinforcement. The second and probably most significant change is to not consider the slab flange for section modulus calculation, with this option being found down the bottom on the right. Despite clause 4.4e of AS2870 explicitly stating this is required, much of the work that went into the deemed to comply data originates from Walsh and Mitchell in the 1980s, and the flange outstands were only considered in the calculation of minimum areas of steel from the 2009 concrete code onwards. The final change is to set the tensile strength of concrete to match that of AS2870, and not AS3600 when determining the cracking moment. This option can be found just below the consider slab flange option. For 20 MPa, this does result in the same tensile stress as AS3600 for sagging, but is reduced to 1.8 MPa for hogging. These three changes will bring down the cracking moment and subsequently require less steel. So if we now look at our reinforcement again, and this time match it to the deemed to comply, being 3L11 trench mesh bottom, and 1 N12 bar top. We can see that we are now within the design requirements, and so can match the deemed to comply specifications for our H1 articulated masonry veneer raft slab. That about covers all you need to know for designing a residential raft slab to AS2870 in Structural Toolkit. Feel free to check out our website and our other videos for more tutorials and help with using this software. If you have any questions, please contact our support team via email or by calling us. Thanks for watching.